A warm welcome to everyone from wherever you're joining us for this important and timely discussion on global public debt. My name is Dixon Omondi, Divisional Director for Southern and East Africa, the National Democratic Institute, and I'm privileged today to moderate this discussion with these distinguished panelists. As we start, let me note that for those who need, French and Spanish language interpretation is available. If you click on the global icon at the bottom of your screen, you will be able to access interpretation. Uh, I am pleased now to welcome one of our partners and co-hosts for today, Tim Hanstad, Chief Executive Officer at the Chandler Foundation to make opening remarks. Tim co-founded Landesa, which is one of the leading land rights organization. He's a SCOL Social Entrepreneur Award and a Schwab WEF Outstanding Social Entrepreneur. I recently had the privilege of seeing Tim at the Lusaka Democracy Summit, and it's great to see him again here. Welcome, Tim. Thank you, Dixon, and uh, welcome everyone on behalf of, of NDI, of Open Government Partnerships and the Chandler Foundation. Um, it's, it's great to be with you all today. As we all know, the, the world has come together to set 17 common sustainable development goals. And our topic today, the growing and opaque public debt, stands in the way of every single one of those goals. By all accounts, debt levels have hit an all-time high and have substantially increased over the past 15 years. Perhaps more distressing, there exists an alarming degree of opaqueness, a lack of transparency in the levels of debt, in the details of the debt agreements, and importantly, in the processes through which governments take on debt. In practice, loans are often given without parliamentary and public scrutiny, and in the worst cases, without the existence of the loan being disclosed at all. That lack of transparency and accompanying accountability have helped lead to 44% of low-income countries today facing a high risk of debt distress, 44%. And 12% of low-income countries are already currently experiencing debt distress. Dozens of countries now spend more on debt servicing than on health, education, and social protection combined. And the lack of debt transparency also has major consequences, major negative consequences for governance. By its very nature, opaque debt increases opportunities for corruption. And here one can point to many devastating examples. Moreover, it can contribute to unhealthy balances within the relative branches of government as the executive branch uh, can get further strengthened at the expense of legislators who can be kept in the dark as to the true state of their country's finances. And finally, opaque debt inherently violates the principle of right to information, certainly for legislators who are tasked with oversight, but it's also for civil society, for other lenders, and for the public at large. So in sum, the, the lack of debt transparency stands as a major challenge for our planet. And yet the topic has not received its rightful place on the global development agenda. So our, our objectives here today are threefold. First is to take one at least modest step towards elevating this topic on the agenda. Second, to highlight the pressing need for all relevant stakeholders to do more to ensure transparency and accountability on debt. And third, to share some standards, some lessons, some potential policy options on the how to do that. And we have today an amazing diverse panel to help us achieve those objectives. And with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Dixon to further frame the issue, to introduce the panel and to moderate the discussion. Thank you. Dixon, to you. Uh, thank you very much, team. You've done very well to frame uh, the topic and discussion today. So I'm going to just add a few things. Uh, first is to say that the timing for this event is very deliberate. Uh, we are now about a week off uh, from the Summit for Democracy. 
and we are also just uh, on the cusp of the International Monetary Fund and World Bank Spring meetings. So we really hope to see that we see this as a valuable opportunity to connect the dots between democracy uh, and the global finance architecture. Uh, and more so because uh, we come from a position where we see the global public debt in need of a democratic reset. Uh, Tim, I think you've done very well to sort of highlight how this problem uh, has, uh, has become an important one, uh, particularly with respect to the inability of some of the world's poorest countries uh, to spend on health, education, and social protection uh, because they have to service debt. Uh, and we also know that uh, you know, when austerity measures are put in place, uh, they disproportionately affect women and other vulnerable groups. So exploring the, 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 the democratic dimensions of debt uh, is very critical. Uh, you know, loans contracted without parliamentary public scrutiny, uh, and sometimes like in Mozambique, without even knowledge at all, uh, you know, can be quite challenging. Uh, and citizens and, and media and, and parliaments uh, then are unable to conduct basic oversight uh, on how the government overall manages debt and uses loans. Uh, and so uh, this discussion today is very important. Uh, we note that the problem is not just one on the shoulders of the borrower countries, but also on the lenders, because routine disclosure by lenders is also often suboptimal. Uh, China, for instance, which is, uh, we know, one of the largest bilateral creditors, uh, requires very strict non-disclosure clauses uh, that impede publication of their contracts and even terms, uh, including in Kenya, where I'm right now seated, that has been a big debate. Uh, we understand you know, there's a registry by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development uh, from early 2002 uh, for private lender contracts, but uptake for that has been fairly limited. And so today we are very privileged to be joined by these five distinguished panelists uh, who are going to help us discuss uh, these issues. Uh, uh, Honorable Gladys Ganda is chair of the Malawi Parliamentary Committee on Budget and Finance. Uh, she has a long distinguished career in the banking industry over 20 years at the National Bank of Malawi. Uh, and she also served as the Deputy Chief Executive Officer for the National Oil Company Limited. Arturo uh, Herrera uh, comes to us from uh, the, the World Bank. He's a Global Director for Governance Global Practice in the Equitable Growth Finance and Institutions Practice Group. Uh, for me, I think it's also very important for this discussion that in his previous life, uh, he served as a minister in charge of finance and public credit uh, for the government of Mexico. So as you will see, he understands both sides of the divide, you know, from being somebody who contracts and reports on public debt uh, to also seeing it from the side of the World Bank. Uh, Nadishani Pereira uh, joins us from Transparency International Sri Lanka, where she's executive director, uh, and she has done wonderfully well in that regard to highlight some of the problems there with public debt. Uh, we are also joined by uh, Rosary Tucci, who is the Acting Deputy Assistant Administrator for Democracy, Rights and Governance, uh, DRG Center at USAID. Uh, she has worked in a variety of positions supporting democracy and human rights, particularly on issues affecting vulnerable people, populations. Uh, and lastly, we also are privileged to have with us Sanjay Pradhan, who is the Chief Executive Officer for Open Government Partnership. Uh, Mr. Pradhan has also served as World Bank's Vice President for Leadership, Learning and Innovation, and Vice President at the World Bank Institute and Director for Governance. So I will now proceed to invite the panelists to make brief responses to a set of questions, a number of questions that I will provide. Uh, if time permits us, I will also allow audience questions to the panelists. So please uh, type in your questions in the chat box uh, and we will uh, get to those if time permits. Uh, remember that we have uh, Spanish and French language interpretation if you need to access that using the globe icon at the bottom of your screens. So Nadishani, why don't we start us off uh, in this discussion by reflecting a bit in your view, uh, is the current public debt crisis a consequence of a democracy deficit? Um, and you know, how do you think debt restructuring and transparency can happen in a way that supports better oversight and reduces the risk of corruption. Uh, I know you are speaking uh, from Sri Lanka and I uh, have worked quite a bit on Sri Lanka as well. So what do you also think people from outside of Sri Lanka can do to help? Yes, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, definitely, yes. Uh, the current crisis, the economic crisis, the bankruptcy of our nation uh, is intrinsically connected 
uh, to a governance crisis, uh, which, uh, which demonstrates a massive democratic deficit. Now, uh, ordinary citizens from all walks of life, in fact, realized this, understood this, and hence we had last year's unprecedented People's uprising in Sri Lanka, which uh, drew uh, headlights, uh, headlines around the globe. Uh, the, the, the one demand of the citizens was for accountability uh, from the highest governance levels, uh, saying this was a preventable disaster, this economic crisis. And people understood by then with all this different information coming every now and then about the level of corruption in the country, uh, about uh, it being systemic, about it being grand corruption, about the siphoning away of public resources. See, the whole uh, democratic uh, contract we have was broken. Um, uh, people have lost their trust in their so-called public representatives whom they elected. Hence, they are demanded that from the president to the parliament, you know, they step down. And also they demanded a systems change. After all, uh, the, the, if you look at the decisions of the, the government that led to the ultimate bankruptcy of the nation, uh, those decisions were taken against the advice of economic experts. Uh, and, and people just in front of our eyes, we saw the economic crashing. And we saw even, uh, even when we hardly had any reserves remaining upon being paid. And, 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 and the question was, for uh, whose interest were these decisions taken? Is it for, to, for private interest or is it in the interest of the country? But in a sense, if you look at the big picture here, uh, uh, it's not surprising because these teams like tactics taken from uh, kleptocrats. Uh, it's, it's not anything new uh, to our country, but you know, oh, from independence, we've had uh, a, a growing kleptocracy. And by now they are well established. And in this situation, attacking democracy uh, is a tool. I mean, after all, uh, if there was true representative democracy, uh, if, if actually our representatives spoke, voiced the, the, the people's need and took decisions on our behalf, uh, upheld the stewardship they have on public resources and were transparent about these decisions over debt, these critical decisions that they make, uh, 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 bonding us and our children and future generations uh, to debt, uh, if there was any level of transparency, uh, then this would not have happened. But in fact, we see that even the parliament that has vested with parliamentary, with the power to provide oversight on public finance, failing to do so, and that power being uh, vested with the executive. So we saw also parallel to this attacks on civic space. Um, and if you would have seen the protests that started beautifully and peacefully were later on suppressed uh, violently. And now people are in fact worried and uh, they fear going out on the streets because even a, a, a draconian, uh, well-rejected uh, law, the Prevention of Terrorism Act is being used against activists who would dare question, who would demand the right to information, who would dissent. So obviously there is this direct connection and at this crisis, at this juncture, uh, your last point, you know, what can the what can those from other countries do? What can the international community do? I would say, what can the international financial institutions and bilateral donors do? Uh, this we are desperate for your support right now. If there's anyone who has leverage with the regime, with the government, it would be these institutions. We are crying for breath, you know, from including the IMF. So therefore, you have the ability to uh, ensure that certain conditions come along with this uh, support, uh, conditions that will make it mandatory for essential anti-corruption reforms, essential transparency, accountability being infused into the management and dissemination of such debt so that citizens 
can also uh, directly uh, see how these decisions are made, how this, uh, the, this, this funds, this aid or the loans will be used. So I'll stop there, uh, given the short time, but yeah, we can continue. Uh, thank you very much, Nadishani. And you know, if I pick from what you are discussing, it's just sort of outlining the importance of democratic institutions, uh, both in the context of decision making, making decisions around public debt, uh, but also in the oversight aspect of it and how, you know, open civil society, uh, civic space and allowing civil society to be able to engage uh, will be helpful, how parliaments uh, in themselves will be able to uh, participate in that process. Uh, and in fact, you've even gone beyond that sort of place, a, a role and responsibility uh, on international financial institutions and partners, which I hope uh, we will get to interbit. Uh, but that parliamentary aspect is also an interesting one. And so I wanted to try and uh, see what Honorable Gladys Ganda, you, you think about this in the context of Malawi. Uh, you chair the Budget and Finance Committee. Uh, what do you really think is the appropriate role uh, uh, of parliament in the context of debt negotiation and approvals? Uh, and I know you also probably have a lot to say about the general situation today uh, for the Malawi parliament. Uh, before you get to that, uh, also just sort of our deepest uh, sympathies and apologies uh, and, and solidarity uh, with uh, Malawi for the uh, dealing with the aftermath of the cyclone uh, that uh, you've had to deal with over the last several days. Honorable Ganda. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dixon, for, for having me. And uh, just to share a few thoughts on the subject. That is, uh, and thank you so much also for passing your condolences. Uh, I'm one of the MPs that uh, um, come from an area that has been affected heavily by uh, Cyclone Fred. And in my constituents, I've, uh, I've got, I have about uh, 20,000 households. Uh, that's almost uh, 80,000 people that have been affected and are homeless as I speak. So thank you so much for those thoughts. May uh, the souls of those that we have lost uh, rest in peace. Um, talk, coming back to the issue that is being uh, discussed here uh, regarding the role of power in the deep negotiation and approvals. Uh, my take is that uh, uh, the role of deep negotiations is very important, especially now when the risk of deep distress is um, emerging in most African countries. Uh, given the impact of public debt to the overall um, economic well-being uh, of a country, it is imperative uh, that parliaments uh, we excise, excise the oversight role over public debt and also public uh, debt management. This is necessary because of the potential risks associated with leaving the executive arm of government to manage the public debt without uh, proper oversight uh, scrutiny. So the oversight role of parliamentarians should be exercised from the onset, from the debt negotiation to debt approval and also implementation itself. So those all, all those three stages, we have to make sure that as parliament, we play our uh, rightful uh, oversight role. Now, during debt negotiation and approvals, my, my, my um, input is that uh, parliament should uh, scrutinize the government's uh, borrowing plans and also assess the impact of new debt on the economy and the country's fiscal uh, condition. This may probably involve the debt, uh, you know, analyzing the debt uh, repayment plan, borrowing terms such as interest, probably moratorium, all that, all those terms and conditions that come with the debt. It's uh, with the with, with in the, when we're um, contracting uh, the the, the contract, contracting the debt itself. So we need all that. So um, as I mentioned as well, you have to be involved from from, from the way to go. And also, parliament should also be involved in setting things on the amount of debt the government can borrow at a given period of time. Uh, this is just to ensure this is sustainable and uh, does not threaten the economy, uh, the country's long-term uh, economic stability. Uh, the citizens of the executive arm of government is borrowing within the uh, approved ceilings. My other thought on, on this issue is also that uh, parliament should also ensure that there is transparency and accountability during debt negotiation, information on the laws uh, agreements should be made public and also made available on time uh, for public scrutiny. It doesn't help to give parliament uh, information when you're, you're discussing the, uh, the, the uh, bill itself in parliament. Probably an hour or two 
before a big a stable environment. It's better that information is given in, in on time so that the, even the public should get involved in scrutinizing the whole bill. Now, in order to ensure accountability before a loan is approved, the responsible, uh, whether it's a ministry, uh, government ministry or department or agency, or even if it's a state-owned enterprise, should commit to effective use of the funds. Now, this is now a call for effectiveness and efficiency in resource utilization. Uh, because I've seen um, um, debts being negotiated, being done, but if you being availed, but if you go on the ground, you see that nothing is happening. And you wonder, you wonder what to say, what is it that they're doing with this, with all these loans that we are we are we are borrowing? So it's very important that that, that even the utilize that. You know, uh, give comfort. Honorable Ganda, uh, I think we are having a bit of connection problems with you. So um, uh, maybe you, you just can summarize uh, at this particular juncture and then we can always come back to you later on. But I think we're having a bit of sound issues. Oh, sound, okay. Sound issues? Should yes, I, and, and actually um, to save bandwidth here, can we actually have you uh, remain unmuted so that we can hear you, but disable your video? Um, I think that okay. that would help with the uh, with the issues there. Yeah, we have network problems here. Okay, let me do that. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. All righty, and uh, can you uh, can you go ahead and speak and let's see if that if that helps with the issues here. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Right. Um, the other issue that I wanted also to share with the team is uh, to do with um, mandatory referrals of money bills to the Budget and Finance Committee. My also view is that there must, there must be some mandatory referral of money bills to the Budget and Finance Committee of any parliament it's for proper scrutiny and also to make sure that they also give their input. Because what is happening as we speak is that there isn't no money bill is referred to the Budget and Finance Committee right here in my, in, in, in my country. As, uh, it, they say it's, it, it has been trad tradition. And yet we have signed a commitment on the same with um, open government uh, partnership that we should be uh, referring the bills uh, to, to, to the committees, but nothing is happening. So yes, uh, Parliament do also approve. That is, I, 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 I agree, you have to approve, but disapprove the loan authorization, authorization field, that's your role, and also provide oversight on the loan usage by the, by, by the relevant uh, MDAs and what have you. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's not good enough just to approve the loans, but you should also be in a position to follow through, make sure that what, are you, what you approved in, in Parliament is uh, translating to what people are supposed to get on the ground. Um, another issue that I also wanted to share is to uh, probably there is also need to adopt and modernize the development of a legislative uh, framework for debt management. This includes debt management registration as well as secondary or subsidiary registration. And also parliament can enhance transparency and accountability by adopting a single integrated debt management law. Such a law provides a strategic direction to borrowing decisions and clearly specifies the roles and responsibilities of the institutions involved in debt management. Now, that's, those are my thoughts. But the situation right here in Malawi, in, in, uh, to cut a long story short now, to summarize um, everything, the situation is that, uh, yes, Budget and Finance Committee has been given powers under the Public Finance Management Act, uh, uh, 2022, to monitor all budgetary matters falling within the competence of the National Assembly under the Act, and also report on those matters to the National Assembly under, under, under outstanding orders. And the Budget and Finance Committee is mandated to scrutinize government domestic and international borrowing policies. And also, uh, it also it's, it's also mandated to review bills with financial and budgetary impl uh, uh, implications. And the, the minister in charge of a bill is supposed to you know, refer the bill uh, to uh, the house for 28 days to deliver the bill to the clerk, and then the bill is circulated to all members of parliament for at least 28 days before first reading it in the assembly. Now, what is happening is each and every bill, money bill, is that is that is not going through this this process of 28 uh, days. And there's also an, another standing order that says that you if you if you if you're in a hurry, probably you should you can circulate the bill uh, within seven days, and then people can 
can you debate, uh, they deliberate on the bill. But what is happening as I speak is that a bill is circulated at 10 o'clock and the discussions are happening at 11 o'clock. Members have no clue, they are clueless of what is happening. They're just approving the bills that they're not, they don't know what those bills will bring to, you know, to the economy of this country or whether the funds, the funds will be good in, uh, being put to good use. So that's, that's a key challenge that we, 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 we have. And uh, furthermore, um, there's also limited information that is being given to, 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 to the owner members. So the limited information that accompanies uh, loan authorization bills limits the amount of scrutiny that can, that can be done. A bill is presented in the parliament without giving the tenure of the bill, no pricing, you don't know the costing, you don't know the whole amount, even the project, the total project cost of the whole, whole thing. So you are having information in bits and pieces. We, so as such, in the end, uh, owner members, are, you know, they actually, we actually fail to, you know, have a meaningful discussion on those uh, on on, the, on, the, on those um, uh, bills. And uh, the, uh, the Public Finance, Finance Management Act, Act does not clearly outline at what is the recommended level of debt which should have been which have helped in setting a threshold for borrowing to control government borrowing. So there is a lot that is uh, happening. Yes, we have laws. Laws are very clear, but there are also shortcuts that are being done, most of that, and especially with the money bills. And the tradition has, all, has always been that money bills are not being referred to, to uh, uh, parliamentary committee on budget, budget for scrutiny. And yes, and yet it's already in our act, and yet it's already in our standing orders. So you see we have standing orders, but uh, you're doing shortcuts. So on that one, um, I think there's also, there's room for, for improvement that we, there's need for us to, to, do, to do more. Thank but, you, Honorable Ganda. Uh, thank you, Honorable so Ganda. I think we'll have another opportunity to come back to this. But, you know, I hear you adding very passionately that uh, the traditional role of parliament in mutual control and accountability of the executive uh, is one that, uh, in fact, is very important also in the context of public debt. Uh, and that, you know, whether you have frameworks or, or not, uh, without parliament being effective in its work, uh, then there will be problems. So we'll get back to this uh, later on. I think you've also talked about Malawi and uh, the membership uh, to the open government partnerships, which I think might be an important opportunity to then uh, draw in Sanjay into the discussion. So Sanjay, as the chief executive uh, of the open government partnerships, uh, what do you see as the governance challenges uh, or challenge underpinning public debt today? Uh, and how can OGP, uh, open government partnership, help? Thank you, Dixon. Hi, everybody. Real pleasure and honor to be here. Um, the underlying, Dixon, to answer your question, the underlying governance challenge uh, stems from lack of transparency and public oversight, quite simply. So these, public, these loans are being contracted without any public knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. Parliaments are sidelined, as we heard from the Honorable uh, uh, Ganda. And uh, we have uh, lenders... Uh, government agencies and politicians eager to fast track their deals, which may be in their private interest, but not in the public interest. So that is the underlying governance challenge, a lack of transparency and public oversight. But there are severe consequences of this governance challenge. Uh, there is the development consequences, which we often hear about, and Tim summarized it very well. You have a set of countries that are facing the risk of economic collapse. We have Lebanon, Sri Lanka, Zambia, who, that have already entered default on their borrowing levels. And another dozen or so countries face similar risks. As Tim quoted, according to the UN, uh, 25 of the poorest countries now spend more on debt service than on health, education, and social protection combined. So that's the development consequence. But there are big governance challenges as well, gov big governance consequences. As Tim also said, uh, this ac accumulated uh, non-transparent debt fuels corruption. The government of Malawi um, sort of uh, borrowed and reportedly misused without disclosing uh, uh, loans from the private banks totaling $1.3 billion. A second governance consequence is that societies are saddled with a whole host of huge, expensive, unproductive white elephants. In, um, in um, uh, Zambia saw the Lusaka Chirundu Road wash away in seasonal rains just after it was built and uh, it's $68 million stadium 
uh, with a capacity of 50,000 rarely attracts more than a crowd of 5,000. So you have these white elephants that get contracted and societies are left holding the bag. Third, we are seeing, which is one of the comments in the chat box, um, uh, that opacity is expanding the authoritarian influence. We haven't yet uh, talked much about China here, but the world's single largest creditor, China, has used this lending to expand its influence, um, including through non uh, through confidentiality clauses and collateralizing strategic reserves. And because the terms of the loans are not being disclosed, the general public uh, is unaware of is oblivious of these costs. And uh, it was great to hear from Nidashani uh, from Sri Lanka, where I was just there in January, where citizens in fact have become aware of these costs and have taken to the streets. So that's when public awareness and public oversight kicks in. So the bottom line is what should be done? What are the solutions? If you look at the evidence from the uh, evidence um, uh, in the literature, it really shows that transparency and public oversight matter. Numerous studies underscore that debt transparency reduces the amount of debt and lowers the cost of borrowing. We have also seen very promising initiatives that expand public oversight. For instance, you have a CSO coalition, the CSO uh, Debt Alliance supported by NDI Dixon, uh, which is actually monitoring, uh, making debt transparent and monitorable. Now, these are the two aspects that we need. We need transparency and we need public oversight. And that quite simply is what open government is about and how OGP can help. OGP can help on the one hand with enhancing government transparency in OGP action plans, and on the other hand, by enhancing public oversight from parliaments and civil society and citizens. Now, we have seen this work well in the area of fiscal transparency more broadly in OGP, which is an area where we have the, uh, the largest accomplishment in the last 11 years. Most of the OGP members have opened up their fiscal regime through OGP action plans, including opening up budgets, publishing budgets and accounts, participatory budgeting, opening up procurement contracts. Now, when they open up budgets and accounts, that includes debt, but it's unclear whether the quality and quantity of the reporting is sufficient for what is required for good monitoring. On the issue of debt transparency and oversight, particularly, we don't find that progress has been more limited quite candidly. We have Bulgaria and Malawi use their OGP action plans to disclose better their current debt obligations, but much, much, much more needs to be done to match the scale of the problem. So what, what we need is for stakeholders around this call and elsewhere to leverage their OGP action plans to scale up reforms. For instance, um, uh, disclosing and publishing um, the terms and conditions of loan agreements for parliament and the public. So there's transparency and oversight. For instance, ensuring that there is independent, professional, timely audits of the debt portfolio and the findings are released to the public. These are just some illustrations of what we need. So in closing, we must understand the political economy of this challenge. We have very powerful vested interests from foreign and domestic vested interests that benefit from opaque debt and unaccountable debt accumulation. Therefore, what we need, and that's why I call upon government reformers, parliamentarians, civil society to join forces, forge a coalition, a multi-stakeholder coalition that can push back and shine a spotlight on debt to ensure it serves the public interest not the private interest. Back to you, Dixon. Uh, Sanjay, thank you very much. And you know, it was a great pleasure to see uh, debt becoming one of the issues that was discussed at the last OGP African Middle East gathering in Marrakesh, Morocco last year. Uh, so, and, and as well to hear sort of the progress being made by countries in terms of debt commitments, Bulgaria and Malawi you talked about, uh, and, and hopefully that is something that uh, we will continue building upon as we go along. But, you know, you, you've laid this problem out very equivocally that, uh, you know, uh, unequivocally that transparency, openness uh, leading to better oversight uh, is what is needed. And, and, it, and then you've talked about uh, the, the sort of political economy analysis and, and the, the 
the fact that they are both international and private interests at hand. So I thought maybe this is a good opportunity for Arturo Herrera to then come in and discuss a little bit uh, whether you think this subject of transparency and accountability is going to be a big one uh, next week uh, or the, in the next coming days when the IMF and World Bank meets for the spring meetings. And particularly how you think lenders uh, can adjust their own practices and operations to support public right to information, citizen participation and parliamentary oversight of debt. So thank, thank you, Dixon. I would say it's already a big issue. Uh, I mean, there, there will be a, a lot of conversations next week, but it's already a, 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 a big issue. Uh, international lenders are like, like, like the World Bank, we tend to come to this issue from two different angles. One is as us as a creditor, and uh, but also in, in, a, in a different position as uh, uh, through the collaboration that we have with the countries, right, to help them proper debt management and debt transparency frameworks. And, and this is really important because as, uh, uh, as relevant as we want to think our lending is, is really just a minuscule part of that. Uh, probably in a, uh, just, just so that you have an idea, emerging markets borrow just from the, from the, from the bond market at $3.5 trillion last year. So what we do is, 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 a, is a minor part. So we, we work in these two, in this, with, with these two, with the, in these two roads, and I'm gonna to refer to the first one, but we also acknowledge that what our lending is a minor part of all the lending on, on the developing world. So let me start very quickly on what we do directly. And, and there's, there's, there's several layers of transparency in, in, in our project. In our project, first, we, we, we need to, to, to make sure that we comply with all the legal framework in each of the country. The projects are this, and, and, that, and that includes that are, they are approved in the budget and by the parliaments. Second, these are discussed with the governments, but are also discussed and approved by our own board. And the board is represented by members of, of other governments within the, uh, the bank. Third one, and this is quite interesting, there's a citizen engagement component on all our lendings. And those activities could be smaller or bigger and depends on, 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 on the nature. Then whenever we release, uh, we, we approve a project, there's a press release uh, uh, from the World Bank. And then all our, our uh, project documents from all our loans are actually uh, made public through our, uh, through our uh, webpage. That there, I, I would say there are two different kinds of, 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 of loans that we provide. Some are about uh, specific investments, and that's really important because what is also made public is what are the uses of the resources and what are the expected outcomes of the resources. So if, if, we, if, we, uh, if we lend uh, to a country to build schools or to build hospitals, uh, we want those schools and those hospitals to be built, but also want to have impacts on education and health. And uh, we are also accountable for that. We have our own uh, evaluations in, 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 in the bank, which tend to be uh, very, very strict. But as I said, that's just one part of the lending, uh, of the lending uh, uh, to development countries. And probably much more important is what it comes from other sources. Bonds, as I said, is 3.5 billion, bilateral loans, which already some of you refer, and loans with commercial uh, entities. And what, there, what we are trying to build is to make sure that there are the proper debt management structures, but very importantly, and more often now, debt transparency uh, 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 technical, technical assistance. And we are doing a little bit more than you can imagine. I actually, uh, learned it just three weeks ago, uh, what were we doing on, on, on these issues. Uh, for the poorest of the countries in the world, which are what we call uh, IDA, uh, IDA countries, and there are 75 of them uh, uh, identified in this condition, we are expected to have from, uh, from June last year to June 25, 50 different, working with different, 50 different countries on their debt transparency framework. Already, we have already 25 activities on, so, on, on with some countries. So we are half, uh, halfway there. And probably what, just one, a couple of, of, of things more. 
uh, before I exhaust my five minutes. Uh, uh, one, one is um, uh, there's really important and there's a lot, uh, I would say already good practice in some countries about how to provide information in a timely um, basis for parliaments. And there are good practices about what should be the overs the proper overseeing from the parliaments, like approving the net indebtedness, et cetera. What is there's less experience is about how to provide the proper information for the citizens. Because if the information is provided in a very technical manner, even if that's very transparent, is not necessarily the way in which is easily digested by the citizens on the street. So, so that's a lot of work that we probably need to do on, on that aspect. Let me stop here. Uh, thank you very much, Arturo. And I'm seeing also a lot of great questions coming in via the chat, uh, which I hope we will get to. Uh, but before we do that, uh, Rosary Tucci, I wanted to see what you think, uh, you know, in terms of whether the international architecture for debt is in itself adequate. Uh, you know, it provides for adequate disclosures on a consistent and comprehensive basis. Uh, and whether you think debt transparency is important, which really is a question that my good friend Jason Braganza from uh, Afrodad is asking, that, you know, is transparency on its own enough? Uh, so how important is debt transparency from the perspective of USAID? Um, how is USAID working with borrowers to support uh, domestic level debt accountability? And how generally are you engaging with international lenders? Great, thank you. Um... First, it's exciting to be here with uh, such a diverse set of stakeholders, and I think that's really uh, indicative of how the conversation is changing. Um, really at aid, whether it's our own administrator or our new office of the chief economists and, and now the DRG Center, soon to be a bureau, we are really interested in deepening the conversation on the impact of debt and the use of democratic principles to improve economic well-being. So, I mean, for us, the case is, is really quite clear why uh, debt transparency is, is important. Um, and I don't want to, you know, go over the problem. Again, I think Sanjay and Tim, uh, you covered a number of pieces, all, all the panelists really. Uh, the, the one piece I do want to mention is also the impact uh, that this has on public trust, right? And in the democracy space, um, this is a, a, a challenge that we're really trying to tackle. Um, the authority to borrow is a cornerstone of the public trust. And of course, this is premised on a government's commitment to take on debt responsibly in ways that benefit citizens. So I just wanted to add that element uh, to the conversation of, you know, uh, the lack of transparency in this problem set when loans are, are contracted out of the public eye. Um, one of the things that many of you, I'm sure, on the call know uh, on the call know about is our, our annual debt transparency monitor, our team. You know, really uh, conducted the research and, and, and really supported this effort uh, because it really does highlight just how little information local stakeholders have on you know, what their governments are, are borrowing uh, at, the, at the taxpayer's expense, right? And so what we see is that in developing countries, um, only about 60% of the information is being reported. And one interesting data point um, that I saw in this research is that many of the countries that benefited from the relief under the G20's debt service suspension initiative in 2021 actually became less transparent over time. Uh, so something to look into a little bit more. Um, again, Tim, Tim, you mentioned a lot of the risks, so I won't go over those, you know, whether that's you know, public actors expanding their power, eluding the, the democratic checks and balances that Honorable um, Aganda mentioned, you know, the role of legislatures, uh, the media as well, I would also add to this conversation in addition to civil society. Um, we already mentioned the, the impact on uh, exposing the economy to risks. Um, and then, of course, what I mentioned, this erosion of the social contract between citizens. Um, you know, we could also take this conversation at some point later to look at you know, um, what not a, Shani mentioned is, is when there are protests demanding this type of accountability, uh, but also on the flip side, what happens when there's a public backlash because of reforms and austerities needed, right? And so there's a whole nother democracy component to this that we could unpack. But let me just quickly take a few minutes on how we're trying to mitigate these risks. 
Um, and again, we mentioned the, the debt transparency monitor as a useful reference point, uh, but also the rubber really hits the road in, in, our, in you know, our support to our missions and in, in many of these countries abroad to improve their debt management practices and institute stronger coverage and reporting of timely debt data. Um, one of the examples I'd mentioned, I would mention is in the Maldives, um, which is one of our democracy delivers uh, in countries um, where we supported uh, public financial management uh, to, to help support the country's first ever statement of fiscal risk, which laid out the government's fiscal weak spots, including its debt exposure, and which is helping to, to calibrate fiscal policies to become more resilient. Um, and better able to respond uh, when faced with future shocks. Um, Sanjay, I think it was you who mentioned the Civil Society Organization Debt Alliance, right? There's a program in Zambia uh, that NDI uh, supported um, with, the, with the support from USAID. Um, this alliance uh, is bringing together 42 Zambian CSOs uh, who are working to hold their government accountable for its borrowing decisions, including through parliamentary oversight, which um, the Honorable uh, Ganda spoke to. Um, and so you know, really we're looking to enhance this debt support uh, to countries uh, around the world uh, to situate transparency and accountability um, in debt management. And so I think you know you look forward to uh, um, more programming in this space. Um, I do want to touch on one other quick thing before we wrap up, before I wrap up here, is our work with our other interagency colleagues, right? Because we're just, it's just a small piece of the puzzle, but, you know, state and treasury together, we can, we, uh, we all have a role to play in this um, and to make, to make uh, transparency and accountability really a priority for all creditors. Uh, and you know, Secretary Yellen has been one of our most vocal advocates uh, for this greater transparency around IMF lending. Um, while also pushing um, with other lenders, uh, expanding the IMF lending toolkit. And really, again, working with Treasury and State, they've, they've really activated their own diplomatic arsenal in, in finance and foreign policy venues. Um, and they're pressing uh, for fair and transparent debt relief for countries in crisis so that all bi bilateral creditors are participating meaningfully with all their cards on the table. Um, we'll also look at ways to work with private creditors who have been a little bit you know, slower to join the party, but we believe with, with dialogue and trust building, we'll start to see these commercial lenders step up their reporting on what they, what they lend and, and the terms of their contracts. So just to wrap up, uh, again, we're, we're working with partners to strengthen the legal frameworks for debt management uh, and make um, uh, a regular auditing of public debt becomes standard practice. Um, also, again, parliamentary approval of borrowing plans help that to become standard practice. Um, and, and, and then lastly, just looking at, you know, the terms of loans and other debt instruments to, to provide the, the safeguards to assure some relief. Uh, from debt burdens in the event of a crisis. So let me just wrap up there, but just a flavor of the different types of efforts that we're really ramping up here at AID with our uh, economic governance colleagues. I know Steve Rosner and Anton um, are on the phone uh, with us today. Um, and so, so definitely look for more in this space from us uh, and many colleagues uh, in, in, the, in, in our own agency. Thank you. Back over to you, Dixon. Thank you, Ro, for really capturing what USAID is doing in this sector, including the work you're doing with uh, cuts in, in Zambia um, uh, with, with NDI, and really reinforcing really uh, this whole notion question of transparency. Uh, but you know, it's also a problematic uh, question because there's also questions about power relations between the lenders uh, and the borrower countries. So Sanjay, one of the questions that uh, you know, has come is, are there any real remedies uh, for developing countries to counter in this particular case, China's imposition of confidentiality and disclosure terms on them? Yeah, um, I think it is, uh, Dixon, I think this was a great question from Christopher. It is important to invert the dynamic uh, where uh, China's imposition has dominant weight. Um, and then you have in an unequal relationship with a borrower, can, borrower nation. Instead, I think one way to invert this is that there should be domestic law, for instance, with parliament and a public commitment with citizens that mandate domestic disclosure. 
if you have such a public commitment, either in law or a public commitment with citizenry, this would tie the hands of the executive um, in negotiating with China. In other words, the domestic state society contract would outweigh the private clandestine uh, one which is being imposed by a single lender, China. You can point to this is a classic, you know, tying your hands and pointing to the fact that uh, you have a you have a you have a law. In this sense, the secret debt, especially with a major collateral implication, should be required by uh, to be public by law, um, and no debtor, including China, can then break the law. So you in you know, focus not so much internally, just externally in that single relationship between a dominant lender and a weaker borrower, but you look domestically and enhance your forces so that you tie yourself with the citizenry and the law and use that to invert. That's a much bigger power imbalance that you can impose on the dominant uh, lender. That's the way I would, I would, I'll also post it in the chat box, what I just said. Thank you very much, Sanjay. Uh, Nadishani, maybe this is a good moment for you to also chime in. Uh, I know that Sri Lanka is in the midst of a very complex uh, IMF negotiation. And you talked a little bit about what you would like to see IFIs do if you want to uh, expand that a bit to promote debt transparency and accountability. Uh, but there's also a question that Francois put here, uh, which was basically asking, you know, uh, do we need an international body? And he referenced the extract, Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, uh, where civil society, government, and financial institutions come together to set global standards. Is that something that you think in this particular case uh, is necessary? Nadishani? Yeah, sir. Uh, well, I mean, if, if that works well, but, um, uh, you know, we, I mean, if you take our country, we're, we're very good at uh, uh, signing, you know, if you look at the UN system, and we were one of the first to sign any convention that comes around. And, and then we go for the, uh, the review mechanisms, we, you know, we tell our point of view, we debate, then there are resolutions against the country, then there are countries, uh, because after all, Sri Lanka has a fantastic uh, ge geographic uh, location. So everyone, everybody wants a piece of Sri Lanka. So in a sense, uh, we played, the government would play it for their benefit. We have countries who stand by us. And at the end of all of this, and there's a lot of funding and uh, time spent on all this, uh, you know, they come back, uh, the, the rulers, and do what they please. Um, I mean, uh, the, so the, the, the how how binding uh, would such an institution be? Would it be just another mechanism? However, a homegrown solution uh, uh, might work better. Something like the OGP, uh, if you know, of when if there is government buying, and if there was a time to actually push it again, uh, we had a OGP process starting, and then it was just uh, dropped. Uh, by the last uh, government. However, now is a good time uh, for us to uh, advocate for this again uh, with the IMF coming in. And that is something we wish uh, uh, institutions like IMF could easily actually demand. Um, then that way you actually get the government to, you know, pitch something and, and then you have civil society in that process and it's uh, internal in a sense. Uh, I, I think what happens is that I was, by listening to all of this, I have a, um, I'm wondering what happens in a, for a country in a situation of state capture. Uh, from anti-corruption terms, uh, you know, when the kleptocrats have captured uh, your institutions, the legislature, the executive trying to capture the judiciary, uh, and when they can make law. So, you know, there was an idea that you bring in a law. Look, you know, right now, if you look at, if you put on news about Sri Lanka, you will see massive civil society agitation around about this new anti-terrorism act that they are trying to bring, uh, which has horrendous provisions. 
uh, that could literally get me arrested soon after this webinar. Even uh, it's 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 just uh, you know, and, and you know, we 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 fourteen years after the war, we are like, which terrorist are you talking about? So it's directly targeting anyone, uh, you know, who would dissent. And in fact, it gives enormous power to the president and to an ordinary even police officer uh, to arrest you, to keep you, to uh, prescribe you the institution. So uh, th th this, this is, and again, we are pretty sure that if this law uh, is not, um, uh, not uh, ruled out by the judiciary, uh, we have a very small opportunity to challenge the bill, the way our system goes. If it goes through that, if it goes to parliament, our experience is that it can be a horrible piece of leg legislation, but it will get passed because after all, they are not representing us anymore. And in fact, uh, they will do what is told by the party lead. And this is the sad situation. So the laws are not within our control. Uh, the system is not within our control. And, and I suppose the people felt the only thing was to step out and which happened last year. But now, even that is not possible because we are being arrested. Uh, we are being witch hunted and uh, lot, and in a very tactful way and a sophisticated way as, as well, so that there's a sense of um, a ch chilling effect created uh, and there's self-censorship. If you take media or civil society organizations such as us, and it's also very smart co-opting of institutions, civil society and um, a personnel that's also happening. I, I would like to, I'm actually putting a question back to the uh, esteemed panelists and other, we have a very rich uh, audience, very good ideas. How could we help a state that is in capture? Um, so I'm, I have been, I mean, we've been uh, telling the IMS in a such a situation, if you or any other I, I, international financial institution or bilateral donor provides unconditional support. Now we need that support. We're not saying not to give, but if you do provide unconditional, when I mean unconditional, without bringing in essential anti-corruption reforms. Uh, and we, we, we made it clear, we know what those are, right? It's, it's doable you actually are enriching the kleptocrats. Uh, in fact, it is used as a propaganda tool. If you watch our news, you would see how the IMF approval has been used. Uh, it is used and, and in fact, the money, like we've seen in Sri Lanka, this is not our first IMF uh, grant, uh, you know, it's, uh, it will be re-corrupted. Uh, so in fact, you might be harming us more than supporting us. And, and this is uh, but a point I like to uh, hear thoughts from others as well on this. Thank you very much, Nadishani. Uh, I would not like for the conversation to be limited between you and um, uh, Arturo, but I think you raised fundamental questions which Arturo might also want to reflect on. You know, what happens in a context where the state capture uh, and where those countervailing structures and institutions are domestically uh, either absent or not effective enough because of the conditions. Uh, and I think we had Sanjay saying that, you know, uh, that's one way to try and compensate uh, for the skewed power relation. So from the perspective of uh, your seat at, uh, the, you know, uh, World Bank, you know, uh, is there anything you want to say to this? Uh, but as you do that, uh, there's also a question which Jason Braganza has asked, which really is, uh, beyond transparency, how do these things link to the whole concept of economic transformation? Uh, and particularly in the context of Africa, how does that transparency ensure economic transformation? Arturo? Yes, uh, can you hear me, right? So, so, so let me actually uh, first answer some of the questions that somehow uh, Nadishani put, put it. Um, there's no such a thing as unconditional support from the World Bank. Actually, the complaint that we often have from the countries is that there are so many conditions or that the program is so elaborated that it's not fast, right? So we need to think about what are the, the, the resources for. Uh, we need to create a, a framework of re results. There's internal discussions at, uh, uh, within the bank to make sure that actually uh, uh, everybody is convinced that it's gonna is gonna is is gonna is, is gonna have uh, 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 the, 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 the proper result. 
Um, then, uh, so, so, I, so, so I think on, on our side, uh, it's, it's actually the opposite, the kind of thing that you, that, 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 uh, that, that drives our relationship uh, uh, with the government. Now, so th there are different kinds of conditions and, and I'm, I always careful with this term because that tends to resonate to the 80s or the 90s when the, with the Washington consensus and conditional lending and not, not, not really what we, what we do. But for certain uh, kind of our projects, we actually require or agree with the governments to do institutional reforms. And those institutional reforms could be about how do they reform or adopt good practices in the way in which they manage their budget, in the way in which their budget is made transparent, in which uh, accountability measures are in, in, introduced, but also could be in the way in which uh, that, uh, that uh, the transparency frameworks are adopted. So the 25 activities that I, re I refer that have been taking place over the last 18 months are actually on that on 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 on, on, on that on that context, right? Now, uh, so some of the people who precede me had already uh, made reference to the to the complexity and the risk of bilateral lending, which is not registered, and that's really that's really one of the main problems. And it's not only a problem in terms of helping to the debt to be built probably built to a level that uh, goes beyond uh, their sustainability, but it also becomes a problem of the solution of the, of, of the problem. And let, let me be very, very, very frank about it. And this is one of the issues that I was able to witness both from the World Bank, but also when I was a finance minister in Mexico and I was sitting on the G20 conversations. Um, if not all the thought that is made transparent, as some countries are asking for relief on their debt, that they encounter a hurdle there. Because the concern of, let's say, Bank A is that if they made a reduce on the service or actually on the debt of the, of the debt of that country, what that country is going to do is turn around and pay one of the bilateral loans, which are not public. So basically, rather than being helping a country, is, it, may, it may become helping uh, a creditor. And that's really uh, where, where part of the conversation uh, is right now. Now, uh, one of the things that is really important, it's about uh, the uses of the, of the, of, of the lending. And, uh, uh, and I'm concerned because very often in several roles that I have uh, to my life, um, I found that uh, the, the, the public debate gravitates between two different opposite points. One in which uh, debt is demonized, right? And just uh, a few work, a few days ago, I was uh, riding my bike in DC and I uh, crossed past a bus stop in Pennsylvania Avenue. And there's this sign that say, our debt now is $35 trillion. And it, and it keeps building, right? Uh, and it's this idea that the debt of the U.S. is way too high. Uh, sure, it's the U.S. economy is also really big, so that the debt is not really a problem. And actually, the debt on the U, the interest rate on the the U.S. is paying is 4.5 percent, and the inflation in the U.S. is more than 6 percent. So actually, there's a, ne a negative interest rate, real interest rate on the on, on the U.S. Debt. But also, making transparent the uses of the of of, of the debt could help everybody understand and, and, and to properly say that the issue. For example, a large, a large percentage of what the World Bank lent over the last three years was actually COVID related. A large percentage of what we lent was directed uh, for countries to buy vaccines uh, uh, to increase the, the capability of their, their hospitals. Uh, to hire doctors, to hire nurses, so 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 so, uh, so it's it's really important to 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 also uh, uh, focus on on the uses and not only on the financial uh, headlines. Let me stop here, uh, Dix. 
Thank you. And so if I hear you right, you're saying that debt is uh, often needed. Uh, the question is to what use it is it is put to. Uh, and uh, and maybe that, uh, you know, partly then uh, expands this just beyond an issue of transparency to really, uh, you know, how effectively it's used and, and the need for it. Uh, but I wanted to draw you back, uh, Honorable Gladys Kanda, you know, not just in the context of pandemics and crisis, which Malawi is going through right now, uh, we understand that in such context, then these issues become even more complex. Um, so if, if there's anything you wanted to say to that, uh, but I'm also more importantly interested in, uh, you know, the fact that Malawi has just rejoined OGP uh, uh, and, you know, you have a national action plan that includes a policy commitment to improving their <laughs> transparency. So what specifically is this commitment uh, and where do you think the challenges lie in terms of implementing it? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, um, Dixon. Uh, Malawi indeed rejoined the Open Government Partnership in uh, January, and we have a national action plan that includes um, policy commitment to improve debt transparency for, for, for the parliament. Um, what specifically is in the commitment? Uh, there are so many issues that are there, but I'll focus uh, on, the, on, on the key ones. Um, the actual plan has several commitments and the most relevant ones to improve debt, uh, debt transparency are those that require uh, adequate time for scrutiny of loan authorization bills by members of parliament. Uh, that is, I already uh, indicated earlier on, uh, uh, that's uh, allowing to date days notice before the bills are debated by parliament. Uh, why we put uh, to date days notice is to make sure that as other members of parliament, we, uh, we have space to consult our constituents, to also have space to consult the uh, non-state actors, the CSOs, because the CSOs in Malawi they do play a, a, a greater role in terms of assisting members of parliament in, uh, in bill scrutiny. So we're giving those 20 days to make sure that we have those interaction with the uh, key stakeholders. And, uh, and again, there's also another issue allowing for seven days notice before the loan authorization bill is introduced on the order paper. So once um, uh, uh, they want to introduce that, that bill, they must give us seven days notice. And the seven days notice, you, you can't waive it. Parliament can waive 20 days notice. Uh, the, obviously, the executive arm of government comes and says, oh, no, we, there is an agent matter. We need to borrow this money quickly. So Parliament, uh, most of the time, actually, 20 days notice is, is, is waived. But the seven days notice, our sending orders uh, uh, clearly stipulate, sending orders stipulate that you, you can't waive the seven days notice. And also, there's an, an issue of setting up of the budget office within Parliament to research on all upcoming bills so that members of Parliament have adequate notice on the project. So we have that office that he, uh, has been entrusted to do such uh, such issues. Um, and again, the actual plan also recommends that uh, the bills be referred, as I said earlier on, to the Budget and Finance Committee for scrutiny before the debate by the full, by, by full house. Uh, it's there, but it's not happening. Um, it also man it also mandates or asks the actual the, the Minister of Finance to provide more information on the objectives of the bill so that members of parliament have adequate information when we are deliberating uh, the bill and also when we, are, when we are referring to to the stakeholders but that is also that is also not uh, happening um we have of course uh, challenges that uh, we, we we have encountered uh, with uh, those bills expected challenges challenges include like the executive adherence to uh, existing permit guidelines and procedures. They, it's there, but we don't want to change. Uh, there's also lack of coordination among the relevant public institu institutions. The data accessibility is not there. Lack of relevant data and, and uh, uh, relevant data and analysis. Insufficient staff resources. We have insufficient staff at Parliament. We are failing to do a good job. And also technical capacity. Uh, uh, we don't have that uh, capacity to handle it. But more is, is uh, importantly, there's lack of uh, parliamentary autonomy. There isn't parliamentary autonomy uh, that we can talk about uh, at, at Malawi Parliament. And also that, that translates to uh, insufficient uh, scrutiny. So all in all, there's an action plan, yes, but the proof of the pudding is, is in the eating. It's nothing that is, I cannot say that we are doing well on this one. Yes, we are, there's some movement, there's an action plan, probably what is necessary, what, is, what we need to do now is make sure that we implement that plan. But before I give back, back to you, there's another issue that I want to talk about. Involvement on, of CSOs on, on, on any issue that involves the public and the parliament is crucial. And especially when we have a minority of, uh, uh, opposition in parliament. 
you, you have, like ourselves, you, we are less in numbers and the government side, they're more in numbers. So every time they're bringing a, a bill in parliament, regardless of what, what, what you're going to, what you, what you want to say, they will still pass it. But when you involve the CSOs and the public, the public themselves, I can assure you that they, do, they play a, 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 a better role, a, a, a good role. So I want to agree with uh, my uh, colleagues that it, that it did say that it did say that uh, public scrutiny of any bill is very important because they also assist in making sure that the government is always in their lane. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I see we have only a few minutes uh, remaining, and uh, these are. Uh, uh, a question about the role of the youth in demanding accountability, for, uh, public debt accountability, uh, which I wanted to, if, if you allow me, uh, allow Rosary to answer. Uh, and Rosary, because you've dealt a lot with marginalized groups, I wanted to also see what your thoughts are about how, you know, decisions around public debt can be more gender intentional and take into account other marginalized groups as well. Rosary? Yeah, I think there's a couple components to this um, uh, this topic or this piece of the discussion, and it's it's not just about how um, uh, the impacts affect these communities um, adversely, right? We all know that a lot of times, whether it's uh, women or or youth, they're they're not a high priority, right, in the decision making process, and so it's that's a piece of it, right? And how a lot of the the when the pressure of servicing the debt you know reduces resources for public services you know it, it compounds the pain uh, felt by the most marginalized uh, so i mean that's i think one piece of the the inclusion um uh dialogue uh, but i think you know and then that leads to okay so is data available do cso's that youth or women are part of have the capacity to push back um, and meaningfully engage. You know, is the civic space even there for them to do that? As uh, Nadashani was talking about, and that gets back into some of the core development work um, that we support. So I think that's why you see the the, the core democracy work alongside um, the economic reforms, or we're pushing for both of those because these pieces are are so intertwined. Um, I just want to mention one other quick thing because um, we are running out of time. Um, and this is what I was saying before about, you know, and I think Sanjay, you were saying it, you know, where is the power? And I think that's where we have, we can have a whole nother conversation on, you know, how you're building that local power, that local voice, um, not just within the country, but regionally, globally, it's building that global solidarity um, which expands the, the local power base, right? And so that's why we're thinking much more broadly about those types of networks, those types of um, uh, those types of efforts. So it's not just how these, it's not just thinking about how these policies impact these communities um, adversely, but then, you know, what is their power and, and resources to respond to the challenge, um, you know, from their standpoint, right? And so it's not, but, but we all play a piece of this, right? And so we just wanna be mindful of supporting that piece of, of the puzzle as well. But let me stop there again. We could spend much more time on it, but uh, maybe uh, let me hand it back to you, Dixon. Uh, thank you very much, Rosary. I think we are coming to the end of this. And what I've had is a very rich discussion uh, about how transparency and openness itself could, which is a democratic uh, you know, uh, imperative. Uh, can help us improve on debt accountability, debt accountability, and how debt is generally used. Uh, I've heard a lot about how uh, countervailing institutions are important. Oftentimes, the executive is responsible for procuring, using, and reporting on public debt. But we've heard here about the role of civil society, the role of parliaments, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so all these are very important discussions that uh, uh, we need to keep going. I see participants are interested in uh, trying to establish some form of contacts. So if folks want to directly exchange contacts, that's also welcome. But at this juncture, we really want to thank our partners, uh, the Chandler Foundation, uh, OGP, uh, all the panelists uh, who've joined this and the audience as well for participating. Uh, the questions I think were very appropriate, timely. Uh, and so just the, the thoughts that have been shared around them, 
uh, are things that I think we all need to carry on uh, as we go along. So it's been a great pleasure hosting this discussion for the last uh, about one hour, 15 minutes. I want to thank you all for attending and hope that we'll continue to explore the critical linkages between democracy, the global finance architecture, and more importantly, helping push for greater transparency and accountability in public debt. With that, we come to the end of this webinar. I thank you all. Thank you.